Hello. We're really glad that you found us. We are a church family made up of all sorts of people. We come from different backgrounds. You just Jesus. Our desire is for people to know Jesus. To know that they are loved by him. And to be part of a family who do life together. With Jesus at the centre. We meet up every Sunday to worship. And be family together. All seeking to demonstrate Jesus' love to others through being rooted in Christ and growing in love. Whether you're familiar with church or not, you are very welcome at One Christian Centre. As we celebrate together, we hope you engage with us. As we make Jesus known. Thank you, John. Um, you mentioned there in the intro, feeling fresh. I, I got back at 1 a.m. this morning, so I don't quite know how fresh I feel right now. Um, but I'm really glad to be here and have this topic. I've um, been thinking about it a lot during this week, and I know for myself, it's already shaken my world a bit. Uh, well, quite significantly, actually. Um, as most of the Bible does, when you truly take it seriously, when you truly examine those words and it isn't just head knowledge but heart knowledge, when it impacts your decisions day by day, it will shake you up. And we need shaking up. And we live in a world that needs shaking up. We have structures and systems in place and they're toddling along. But God comes along and says there's a different way entirely. A radical way. A radical way that is so much more beautiful than we can imagine. And we each have a part to play in that. So it's a challenge and I do not want anyone switching off right now. I'm not going to speak for very long, but it's going to shake you up because it should we need shaking up. And Father, my prayer right now is you guide my words. You've challenged me this week and I, I pray that I communicate clearly what it is that you want to say in, in the passages we're looking at this morning. Amen. Amen. So, funnily enough, I, as I say, I got back this morning and I've just, I always think it's important to have something visual to look at. Um, so I went on mid-journey AI. Um, not sure how I feel about AI. That's another discussion for another day. But it helps when you want so, some visuals to emphasize your point. I'm just realizing, looking now, this guy looks a tiny bit like me. That wasn't intentional. Um, but anyway, I wonder, I wonder whether you can relate to this guy. I wonder if you have ever felt like he's feeling in this moment. So you look at him, you go, okay. He's holding a present. So why does he not look happy? And then you might think, okay, well, maybe he's not happy because the present he's got is rubbish. It's not what he wanted. Well, no, you'd be wrong because he hasn't even opened it yet. So anyone, let's have a bit of a call and response. Anyone think what, what might have happened in this scenario? He's holding a present, but he doesn't look too happy. He's giving it. He wasn't expecting it. Not sure, uncertainty. Nothing to give back. Could be, could be ticking. <laughs> wow. I, I don't want any presents from you, please. <laughs> um, Dennis was pretty much spot on, actually. Uh, and I have been in this situation, and I reckon probably everyone here at some point has been in this situation. Let's imagine it was Christmas time. 
and there's a knock. There's a knock on the door, and his buddy comes round, and I just want to pop over, mate, and I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas, and I've got you something. But there's that awkward moment where you cannot return the favour because you haven't got your friend a present. Has anyone had that situation? Can you relate to how this guy's feeling? I've had it. Uh, what's that all about? I mean, in that situation, you may say something like, oh, you really shouldn't have. Or, I didn't know we were doing presents. <laughs> something like that, hey? Uh, but there's a strange feeling in your gut because you know there's, there's an imbalance. There's an imbalance. He's got you something, but you haven't got him something. And the scales, as we've got here, as another little visual, again, this was a grab whatever was in the kitchen. I, I, so this doesn't tip as much as I would want. I wanted this to really hit home with my example, where the scale's up here, and this is down here. But look, it's not much of a difference. So I want you to really imagine that that's quite dramatic. Um, so yeah, we all feel strange when we feel like there's an imbalance in the scale. But we live, I want to suggest this morning, we live in a system where those scales are in our mind constantly. So take relationships, take friendships. There, there are scales at play. Um, so we've, we've given an example of gift, uh, a gift. We might think of time as well, um, effort. And there's different exchanges, but generally speaking, in a friendship, you want those scales to, to balance, right? You want it to feel, okay, I'm giving out here, but I'm also getting something back. There's this, the scales are in play. And if the scales become extremely imbalanced, there's probably something not right about that relationship, that friendship. You may end the friendship, the relationship, because psychology, much cleverer people than me, have all kinds of theories, but say that that, that scale of equity, equality, is, is very important in relationships. It's also important in the workplace. So generally, the scales are in play there too. So you give of your time and your effort in a job, but then you are repaid with money, and I'm not going to get into, this could go in all sorts of ways, couldn't it, about, well, there are some people who you might feel are doing basically hardly anything, and they're getting loads of money, and there's an imbalance there, and we can feel frustration, and we can feel anger. Why do we feel that? Well, again, because in our mind, and in our society, and in our structures, it's all around scales of balance. And when we feel like there's an imbalance one way or the other, it doesn't feel quite right. Final quick example of the scales is around justice, right? We want those scales in place. If someone has done something, we feel there should be a consequence that is fair, equal to, uh, the punishment is equal to the action, scales. All right. So uh, it's, I'm, that's just emphasizing my point, really. Scales, scales, because if I want, when I want you to go away after this, and if someone says, hey, what, what did Steve talk about on Sunday? You can say scales, and hopefully that will then bring back some of what is said here. So that's why I'm all about imagery. I love it. Uh, my whole job is making videos, making things come to life visually. And incredibly, Jesus was all about that too. That is one of the main reasons that I love the teaching of Jesus. He got it. He knew storytelling was so powerful. Imagery, things that we could relate to, go away and talk about and tell our friends, hey, I want to pass on this amazing story I heard. So Jesus spoke in stories, parables. And I, I was wrestling this week. I, I could have done a sermon where... We went through five, six different places in the Bible that talked about kindness, bring it all together. But then I just felt, no, I, Spirit guided me to this parable. 
which is interesting because it's normally a parable spoken about forgiveness and it absolutely is about forgiveness. But with a lot of these parables, there's a saying that they're like a diamond. So as you hold them up to the light, you see different things. And that's beautiful. And I think that is often the point of a parable is that it can speak to us in different ways. And actually this parable, which is about forgiveness, spoke to me massively about kindness. And the two are linked as well. Um, But it's found in Matthew 18. We're going to go through it together if that's all right. Matthew 18, verse 23 to 30. We're going to keep in mind the scales and we're going to just work through it verse by verse. Because again, I said we can jump around, but sometimes when we do that, we just miss the sheer power and depth of what is said in three or four verses. If we just grasp that this morning, we've done really well. So 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. I've underlined that because already we're getting a bit of imagery, settled accounts of these scales, right? Something is owed. We're weighing it up. What's the debt? Okay, 24. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. So we'll stop there. One bag of gold at that time was the equivalent of um, 20 years of wage. One bag of gold was 20 years of wage. So what does 24 say? 10,000 bags of gold. The mathematicians among us can figure this out fairly quickly. 10,000 bags of gold with each bag worth 20 years of wages. This man owes the equivalent of 200,000 years worth of wage. So as with a lot of parables and stories, it's extreme. It's deliberately extreme. We should think, read this and, and chuckle a bit. Like, it's impossible. It's impossible. It's clever storytelling. Like, the amount is almost not important. The factor is he owes an amount he will never pay back. It's impossible. It's absurd. Figure there. 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debts. Okay? So far, we're still in a system that everyone hearing this story is familiar with. The scales. You owe, you pay. If you can't pay, you're punished. It's a system everyone's understanding and nodding along. Um, Verse 26. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Again, we can just go through that and think that's, yeah, I understand what he's... No, I don't understand because the context earlier, we've already figured out he can never pay this back. But he he hasn't figured that out yet. Really, really interesting stuff when you break it apart. Be patient with me. He thinks this is an issue around time. If given enough time, his effort, what he does can still save him. He can, he can get out of this himself, given the time. But we've already established, actually, if he is being judged in the old system, with the scales, with the weighing, he's got no hope at all. Here's the part where the story flips and changes It's powerful, it's radical. Verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him. Um, I highlight pity there just because there are other translations that say the master was moved with compassion. Another understanding or way of reading this is full of empathy. 
full of empathy. So empathy is when we put ourselves in the place of somebody else. We feel what they are feeling. It's super important. And empathy, when we do that, leads to kindness. So that's an important point to note. But this man, the servant's master, feels empathy. Cancels the debt. So think of these weights. Think of the scales, the system. He has every right to get back from the servant what he's owed and actually moved with empathy, moved with compassion. He takes the scales away. He breaks the structure of the day, the system, the way society works. He says, no, there's another way. If he hadn't done that, the man is condemned and his situation is hopeless. The master gives him hope by saying, I'm going to strip, scrap the structure. I'm going to smash the scales. Not the end of the story though. Verse 28, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Side note there. 100 silver coins, that was about a day's wage. So again, the storytelling is clever. We've got this kind of route going of, of a ridiculous figure versus a very achievable figure that the, the person owed the other guy. Um, but look how he reacts. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. And listen to the words, because again, the storytelling we've got, there's a reason why he says what he says. He says almost identical to what we've already heard in the story. It's very clever. Be patient with me. We've heard that already. And I will pay it back. So you think all of these things would remind the guy who's demanding the money. Ah, it wasn't that long ago. I said those exact words. But this whole situation seems to the guy who's been let off, who's been forgiven of debt, he, it, he hasn't twigged with him, has it? He's still not understanding what, what's happened to him. And then very, very quickly, he begins to operate in the old system. The old structure, what he's been used to. The scales come back out. Even though the scales were, were removed for him and he, he benefited, his life was changed. He got freedom. But the scales came back out and he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And we're going to stop there because there's so much in this. Um, the story is challenging and, and an initial read of this, a reaction might be, well, what a ridiculous story and what a ridiculous way to act from the servant that he was forgiven. He was shown ridiculous kindness. And then very quickly slips back into an old system where it's, hmm, okay, I'll treat you well if you treat me well. I'll forgive you if you forgive me. Scales, you hurt me, I'll hurt you. Scales. But then I very quickly realized I'm that guy. <laughs> I'm that guy. How often do I do that? My whole faith is based around this belief that I am the recipient of absurd kindness, forgiveness, love, grace. In my own efforts, I cannot get there. But yet God, in his goodness, 
in his kindness, lavishes love on me. Forgiveness. And, and shows a new way. This is the key point. And it's funny, John mentioned it. New structure. Not just ha- a happy thought that Christians are, they're, they're fairly similar to everyone else, but that they just maybe sing a few songs on a Sunday. If you think that's what it is, you've missed the point. It's a whole new way of living. A whole new structure and system where scales are scrapped where we're not keeping our little tallies, our scorecards. I'll be kind to those who are kind to me. I'll give, but only because I'm really looking to get that gift back. And I do it. And if we're honest with ourselves, I'm sure we all do that. But the radical call here is... We've been recipients of incredible kindness. And we should go out and live in the same way. Now, it's a heavy challenge. Um, And I know, literally, tomorrow I'll go out, I'll start my day, and very quickly I will start living out my life in the way of these scales. It feels inevitable. And I'm not going to say, hey, this week, no one's going to do that. Because we're human. And it's countercultural. this call to live God's way. Every message we hear is one that says, hey, look after number one. You are all that matters. There's a story in the Bible about this guy who is building up wealth and putting it in a barn and storing it up. And that that springs to my mind. And, And that's almost what we're told to live like as well. Get everything that's good for you and hold it, withhold it from others. Because if you're gaining... Uh, If you're winning, there has to be losers. And again, it's all around the scales. And we slip into that old system easily. But the challenge is to try and become more aware this week of those moments when that happens. So it will happen. We're human. We make mistakes. But maybe our challenge this week is to just become aware of that when we feel that pull to judge others, when we feel that call to be selfish. Consider the scales and, and have a word with yourself. <laughs> we need to do that. Have a word with yourself. Say, hey, Steve. That is very much a scales system that you're operating in now. But remember that God has dealt with you kindly. That God has stripped away that structure of scales and said, you don't deserve it. But I will be kind to you. I will love you. I will forgive you anyway. I don't think I need to say any more than that. I think there's enough there for us to be getting stuck into for months to come. (laughs) So we know we need help with that, right? (laughs) Because our natures inevitably don't lean towards that way often. So let's pray. Let's pray right now. Father, what a challenge. What a challenge to stand out and live in a different way. In a way that seems absurd at times. But you have shown us absurd kindness and call us to go out and do the same. Where we're not holding tightly to our scorecards of who deserves kindness, who deserves a good old telling off. (laughs) 
Lord, give us the courage to let you deal with that. You are the judge, not us. All we know is that you had every right to, to judge us, to punish us, and you didn't. You put that punishment onto your son who came to set us free, to, to scrap those scales and say, hey, if you reach out for forgiveness, it's here for you. What an incredible, radical message and challenge you give to each one of us. When we live in that way, that other way that you have shown us, that's when the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, can begin to grow. But we need your help with that because it's not our natural inclination so often. So Holy Spirit, point out to us this week the moments that we slip back into the old way. And give us the strength and courage to follow a new way. A way of kindness. The way of Jesus. Amen.